Hi, everyone. Good evening, and welcome, everyone, to tonight's conversation on what it means to be Asian American with Professors Erica Lee and Jason Chang. Um, Professor Chang will be joining us very shortly um, in person, and Professor Lee is, um, has joined us online, so you will be seeing her very soon on the screen. Um, AAPI Westport was formed in March of this year after the Atlanta spa shooting that killed six Asian women at a time when hate incidents against Asian Americans spiked since COVID pandemic began. We are parents who came together because we were concerned about how these events would affect our children in the schools. We came together to join the national rallying cry to stop Asian hate. On March 27th, we organized a peaceful rally to stop Asian hate on Jessup Lawn just outside the library in Westport. Town, state, and federal elected officials, including Senator Blumenthal, Attorney General Tong, and First Selectman Jim Marpy, and hundreds of community members, including Team Westport, came and stood in solidarity to stop the virus of hate and to spread the act of love. Since our rally, we have been working towards spreading awareness and encouraging conversations about Asian American experiences in the schools and in the community. For example, we partnered with the local Remarkable Theater to screen Minari, an Oscar-nominated film about a Korean immigrant family in Arkansas in the 1980s. In addition, we facilitated student speakers from the rally to hold conversations about Asian American experiences in the schools at Salatak Elementary School. I would like to take this moment to thank the Westport Library for giving us this space to have this conversation and Alex Giannini for working with us to make this event possible. Thank you to Team Westport for your support and partnership. And thank you to our national and local friends and organizations for spreading the word on this event. We're joined by so many of you here in person, as well as virtually from around the country. We're having this conversation in effort to understand why and how the virus of hate against Asian Americans spread and how we shape the making of America. Who better to have this conversation than with historians Erica Lee and Jason Chang. Professor Erica Lee is joining us today as an organization of American historians distinguished lecturer. She is an award-winning historian and author, director of Immigration History Research Center at the University of Minnesota, and president-elect of the Organization of American Historians. The granddaughter of Chinese immigrants, Lee was recently elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and testified before Congress in its historic hearings on anti-Asian discrimination and violence. She is the author of four award-winning books, including The Making of Asian America, republished soon with new postscript about Asian American activism during the pandemic. And I'm just gonna plug in right now. If anyone would like to purchase a book, we have books right there to purchase after this program. And if you like an updated version, it'll be available next week online. Uh, she is the author of also America for Americans, published with a new epilogue on xenophobia and racism during the pandemic, available next week as well. Professor Jason Oliver Chang, who will be joining us very soon, um, is Associate Professor of History and Asian and Asian American Studies at the University of Connecticut. He also serves as a Director of Asian and Asian American Studies Institute. He is the president of the Asian American Faculty and Staff Association. Chang was recently appointed by Governor Lamont to sit on the state's hate crime advisory council. He is also a member of the West Hartford Public Schools Board of Education. He works with a number of community organizations to promote anti-racist education and is an advocate for ethnic studies in primary and secondary schools. 
He is the author of Chino, Anti-Chinese Racism in Mexico, 1880 to 1940, published by University of Illinois Press. He also publishes in American Quarterly, the Journal of Asian American Studies, the Pacific Historical Review, the Asian American Literary Review, and the Journal of Asian Diasporic Visual Cultures. So at this point, we're going to continue with the moderated conversation portion. And then when that segment ends, um, we're going to open up for questions from the audience. OK, so Erica, how are you? I'm good, and I can see I can see my big face behind you. <laughs> Thank you, Heather, for, for that uh, wonderful introduction and for organizing this event. I'm really excited to be here. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, so the Atlanta shooting that killed six Asian women was the tipping point for us to stand up against hate because these women were racially targeted. According to StopAsianHate.org, 6,603 Asian hate incidents were reported from March 19th, 2020 to March 31st, 2021, just in one year span. How do we get here? How do you explain this? You know, there's a couple of things that are important to, um, to note about those numbers. First, they are just a fraction of what we believe to be the total numbers of hate incidents and violence targeted at Asian Americans. We know that these types of incidents generally go unreported. Uh, the other important uh, facet about those numbers to note is the um, is how much they reflect an increase in violence against Asian Americans. Um, depending on the numbers and the statistics that you use to compare um, this number, it's either in various different cities, uh, it represents either a 150% increase from previous years or when I've looked at the FBI statistics, the most recent FBI statistics related to anti-Asian hate incidents and violence, um, the most recent numbers are from 2018, and it indicates a 2,600% increase. So either way, you know, this is a, um, a surge, of course, a historic really surge in anti-Asian hate and violence. And one way to think about this is through a really long and unfortunate history of anti-Asian racism and violence. I'm sure many of you in the audience are familiar with some of the more well-known events, including the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882, the World War II incarceration of Japanese Americans, et cetera. Um, but there's also lesser known um, horrific acts of violence, including the mass expulsion of Chinese from cities and towns from across the US West, the mass expulsion of South Asians from cities and towns across the US West, um, the terrorization of Filipinos uh, and Filipino Americans in, in the West during the 1920s and 30s. So, you know, part of what we're seeing is a continuation of this, uh, this long history. Um, but it also highlights some persistent uh, trends and patterns in the ways in which Asian Americans have been racialized. So scapegoated during many different crises, economic, uh, wartime, public health crises, the ways in which Asian Americans have been you know, continuously tied to disease, uh, labeled um, disease carriers and bringers, um, the ways in which Asian Americans have suffered um, and have been blamed during times of international tension, seen as foreigners rather than as Americans. So if we, we look at some of the hated, um, some of the reports of hate incidents that have been tracked by organizations like Stop AAPI Hate, you can see the ways in which this, these historic trends are reverberating through the literal, literal words and, and um, statements of hate. So people being spat upon and um, hearing things like 
go home. You don't belong here. Um, you brought the virus or incidents of violence and physical attacks where, um, where people are, are being sprayed with Lysol uh, because they're considered or being seen as the embodiment of, of disease. So there's this, this long pattern, these long histories, um, but what has happened this past year has largely been the result of the uh, unnecessary and unfortunate politicization and racialization of the disease as Asian, and also the, the rhetoric of Wuhan virus, Chinese virus, blame China, that was so um, persistent and, and consistently uh, used and, and weaponized to, um, to really fuel you know, anti-Asian hate uh, and racism. So this is nothing new, um, but what we've seen has been a spark to the flame uh, of racism. And that has resulted in um, you know, countless tragedies, uh, unnecessary tragedies inflicted upon our communities. Professor Chen joined us. Um, welcome. So glad you can join us. Um, would you like to comment on the first question of how we got here? How would we explain the current wave of anti-Asian hate? Mm -hmm. uh, first of all, thank you for hosting this conversation. Uh, Erica, it's great to see you uh, virtually. Um, and this is, I think, my first in-person event. So uh, yay for that. Um, and <laughs> yeah, it's great to see people again in the flesh. So, uh, but that also brings complications. So I apologize for being late. The children and traffic needed to cooperate uh, for me to be here on time. So I apologize. Um, but this uh, is an important conversation that Erica, uh, uh, you know, so expertly surveyed the, the, the um, the deep cultural historical reservoir of anti-Asian racism in this country. Um, and I think I would offer, you know, it, in, 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 um, to complement the comments that, uh, that Erica made is that um, one of the things that marks anti-Asian racism is also US wars and imperialism. And, you know, oftentimes we think of uh, violence domestically as the product of uh, discrimination, racist ideology, white supremacy, uh, but the fuel and the imagination behind hatred often comes from practices of warfare, right? So, um, so it's difficult for me to separate wars abroad and the racist expressions at home. And one thing to keep in mind about where we are right now is we have been engaged in 20 years of a war against terror. And that has targeted multiple communities, uh, Asian American communities. And so when we think about the escalation of public rhetoric uh, during the Trump administration and, uh, and exactly you know, uh, underscoring what, uh, what Erica was saying about the um, um, the economic um, pandemic and political blaming of China uh, and Asia in general for, uh, for malaise with domestically within the United States produces a very you know, convenient scapegoat, uh, which is you know, frequently Asian Americans. Uh, and so if we think about these patterns, you know, Asian Americans are kind of invisible until they're scapegoated, right? And so that is a pattern that we see again, again, through different periods of economic expansion, incorporation of Asian workers uh, to fuel the economy, and then a backlash, right? So that's a kind of historical pattern that we've seen. Add on to that, the rise of nationalist fascism, the uh, uh, global pandemic, 
right? These are all exacerbating factors that disrupt the norms of society and allow this kind of casualization of, of racist activity. And it's interesting to see what's happening in Asia, kind of like blamed on Asian Americans or people in America. So that seems like a weird connection in a way. Mm -hmm. So in the minds of many people, there's a disconnect between the Asian American history that traces back to the 1800s. I mean, including myself until I read Erica's book, which is an amazing book, by the way. Um, and the recent wave of anti-Haitian aid and violence. You started to make some of these connections. Uh, what do you see in the pattern of anti-Asian hate and violence that reminds you of this long history of anti-Asian anti racism? I'll, I'll take a first stab at that and I'll, I'll just comment on what you just mentioned, which is the ways in which Asian Americans get blamed for something that Asia has done or something that we perceive Asia has done. Um, you know, one of the ways in which racism works in the United States and in many other places, as Jason well knows, um, in relationship to Asian Americans is by triangulating us not only between white and black in the United States, but also between domestic race relations and foreign relations. So we have seen how uh, the best example of this really is the World War II incarceration of Japanese Americans, of course, um, and the ways in which uh, the media, politicians, um, and, and so many others portrayed the entirety of Japanese peoples, including peoples of Japanese descent as enemies to the United States as disloyal to the United States simply because of their heritage and their ancestry. Uh, again, this is, um, this is that foreignization of Asian Americans where we are seen as tied to our ancestral Asian homeland regardless of how many generations we may be here in the United States, regardless of whether we've never been to that homeland uh, before or, or, or if we can speak uh, the language of our ancestors. Um, so this is, this is a continuation of, you know, this is one of the ways, this, the continuation of, of these trends. Um, more recently, we've seen very high profile cases of Asian Americans being targeted as spies. So the case of Wen Ho Lee in the 1990s, a Los Alamos um, scientist who was arrested, kept in solitary confinement um, because he was suspected of, of, uh, of peddling secrets uh, to the People's Republic of China. Um, he was found to be innocent of those charges. Um, the best account of his, of his um, ordeal was written by, co-written by himself and, and journalist and activist Helen Zia. It's, it's called My Country Versus Me. Um, and this is, I think, you know, one of those stepping stones that helps explain then how uh, Chinese Americans during the SARS epidemic uh, in the early 2000s talked about being racially profiled um, when they coughed, that they called it coughing while Asian. Um, another sort of uh, precedent to what we've been seeing during the pandemic. Um, I think the other, thing that has been uh, illuminating for so many Asian Americans is to understand that while this history that seems so far gone, um, perhaps targeting earlier generations of Asian Americans and perhaps has nothing to do with, with um, contemporary communities, how that history actually continues to inform. It continues to shape the ways in which um, Asian Americans uh, are seen within the United States. And I think that um, as a historian, <laughs> you know, I, I think that that's one uh, positive uh, thing that's come out of, of all of this, that we have um, a deeper appreciation for the historical roots of today's crises 
um, and that hopefully some of the lessons um, from previous generations, including their struggles, um, can also provide some inspiration for how we respond today. Thank you, Erica. So the next question I have is when and how did the term Asian American come about? Asia is a large and diverse, is a large continent with diverse ethnicity, culture, history, language, countries. How do we get grouped as one race and what are the challenges of being grouped as one? Is it to me? Or to Either one. <laughs> <laughs> Erica, Jason, no, 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 you start. We'll, we'll <laughs> trade off, we'll trade off. Okay, that sounds good. Um, yeah, for, uh, for the, the beginning part of Asian migration to the United States, most immigrants considered their connection to their home country more important than a shared ethnicity uh, or a, a, a shared you know, racial position within the United States. Um, and that didn't really change until the 1960s uh, and 70s when activists, artists, and uh, other cultural workers began to uh, identify along lines of what is called a pan-ethnicity, which connects different ethnic groups together to show a common experience. And this was Kind of, you know, there were models for this going on at the time, which was the the Black Power movement, uh, the Chicano movement, um, and these were opportunities for Asian Americans to to share a narrative about the experience in the United States that they didn't necessarily share before, and part of that is because uh, many groups saw themselves as as trying to vie for their position within society, within a racist society, right? And so we can see some examples of the ways that Asian Americans in like the 1920s positioned themselves to say, uh, be considered white instead of not white, right? So, um, um, uh, so for instance, Takao Zawa versus United States uh, was a Supreme Court case in which he argued that all of his exemplary kinds of modes of assimilation should designate him as white instead of, uh, instead of, you know, an alien ineligible for citizenship and naturalization, right? So, uh, so part of the reason why we don't see a collective pan ethnicity before that period is because there was, there weren't a lot of. Uh, ways to identify those kind of common threads before uh, a kind of uh, collective conversation. Um, the 60s, 70s, and the Vietnam War provided that language uh, largely around the grounds of anti-war, which every ethnic group had a relationship to US wars. And those provided a kind of common uh, you know, impetus to consider what's happening, what was happening with the Vietnam War and the, and the broader war in Southeast Asia. Uh, that coupled with, uh, with the Black Power Movement and the need to identify um, a, a, a political stakes in the Civil Rights Movement was an important way for Asian Americans to, uh, to, to well, to use that term as a way to, uh, to project a political identity that didn't yet exist, right? A collective identity. And so um, it was artists, mus musicians, poets, um, and activists who helped give meaning to that term uh, that was largely around anti-war, anti-racism, um, interracial solidarity, and, and, and uh, kind of pan-ethnic um, uh, collaboration. Great, thank you. And just to reiterate, I mean, just to highlight the reason why um, the Pan-Asian group wasn't able to form in the previous month, as you explained, is really, really there was a legacy of um, um, 
Chinese Exclusion Act, since 1882 for 61 year period, Asians could not become naturalized citizens. Um, there was a, that era of um, distinct form of discrimination or racism against Asians. And I think that also precluded them from forming this pan-Asian group. Thank you for that, Jason. I'm going to actually ask a corollary question to that, which is, um, uh, I know you recently held a panel discussion um, with the PI portion of AAPI. Mm -hmm. um, so AAPI stands for Asian American and Pacific Islander. And we even named our group AAPI Westport. Um, how does adding Pacific Islander get, how, how did Pacific Islander, Islander get grouped with AAPI? And what are the implications of this grouping? Yeah, thanks for that question. The, um, um, so Pacific Islanders uh, may seem like a really you know, natural kind of pairing with Asian Americans, but uh, that phrasing, that combination of Asian American Pacific Islander came out from administrative convenience uh, from the federal government. Um, it did not particularly arise out of community demands to be included. Right, um, and uh, and so so the the pairing of Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders has been um, uneven in the census and in federal uh, requirements for reporting, for instance. Um, but nevertheless, that kind of conglomeration has uh, has has stuck. And one of the things that's confusing about that is that they are two different pan-ethnicities. Uh, so there are many you know, uh, Pacific Islander nations included in Pacific Islanders. Um, and, and so one of the consequences is that while numerically Asian Americans have, uh, you know, occupy more sort of demographic space within that, that category of AAPI, Pacific Islanders tend to get subsumed under Asian American. Um, and one of the, 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 the fallouts of that is that we don't recognize Pacific Islanders as indigenous peoples, right? They get treated as uh, another, say, racial minority, right? Or, um, or that, that they don't, um, that their particular relationships with US colonialism, struggles for sovereignty and immigration status uh, are all different than what other Asian Americans face, right? So, um, so those are some important kind of like distinct life experiences that, that define what it means to be Pacific Islander that are often ignored when we just use the terminology Asian American Pacific Islander. You know, now it feels kind of natural to just say API, um, but there's a distinct need to articulate the Pacific Islanders in our communities. In Connecticut, there aren't that many Pacific Islanders, uh, but they're here. There's significant, you know, there are uh, Chamorans uh, who live, you know, in this area around Bridgeport and, um, and are also uh, members of the U.S. Armed Forces, which Pacific Islanders have the highest rates of, of enlistment in the U.S. Armed Forces than any other uh, territorial uh, um, unit. So, uh, so it is a distinctive category um, and requires us to, uh, to kind of hold those, that knowledge in, uh, in sort of comparison and not necessarily as a mode of inclusion that we want to be together, but it's useful to compare and to, and to accommodate and to think about those differences uh, because we do actually share a lot of spaces and Pacific Islanders have legitimate concerns about, uh, about Asian influence on their island nations, right? as well as the, the, the claims of citizenship for Asian Americans in their, in their spaces as well, right? So the term API, if we think of it as, as a term of convenience, 
used by the federal government, right? Then it's on us to unpack that and to respect and, and be curious about how to, uh, how to think through those challenges for where we are and where other people are. That's such an important point. There's so much diversity, even within Asian Americans <laughs> and Pacific Islanders. So yes. it really, uh, we really have to take a moment to consider all that. Uh, my next question is, Asians have been described as the model minority stereotype. How did this stereotype emerge and what are the problems of this stereotype? I could start with that. Um, I'm sure many people have heard the term model minority uh, and, and referring to Asian Americans as economically and academically successful. Model minorities supposedly work hard, play by the rules, respect authority, have high moral values and stable nuclear families. Um, and it's because of these values that Asian Americans are so successful, that they have been able to achieve the American dream. That's the way that the framing and that the narrative um, has worked. And it's really a, a product of this transformative time that's happening at the end of World War II into the Cold War and the Civil Rights Movement. We've talked about how you know, there's this era of, of Asian exclusion and World War II incarceration. This is the high point of seeing Asian immigrants and Asian Americans as a foreign enemy, you know, such a threat that we have to erect uh, you know, gates and, um, and create detention centers and, um, and the border patrol to keep out uh, um, Asian immigrants. But then, because of changing foreign relations, uh, we have a new image that starts to um, emerge. While we're at war with Japan during World War II, we're friends, we're at, we become allies with China, with India, with the Philippines. And the United States government is realizing that our rhetoric um, and that our Asian exclusion policies are highly hypocritical um, because they're saying essentially, China, India, the Philippines, we are your allies, we are fighting together, we're in this together, but then the immigration laws are saying, keep out, we don't want any of you to come, you're a threat, you're a danger, you're, um, you're unwanted. Um, so at the beginning in World War II, we, you start seeing these phenomenal um, World War II posters, Chinese, Filipino, Indians, with a, a soldier and the label Chinese, and then another label down here that says, um, this man is your friend. Um, and so there's a, a real sort of public relations campaign to, to remake the image of, of Asian um, peoples, certain Asian peoples, immigrants and, and Asian Americans as friends all of a sudden. Um, during the Cold War and Civil Rights Movement, we have the beginning of the successful model minority. Again, the key here is that they're still a minority, um, still you know, uh, not totally included and assimilated, but they uh, should be held up as the model for other minorities. Um, there's there's uh, Chinese American and Japanese American families that get profiled in community newspapers across the United States. And in fact, um, my family in, in Buffalo, New York was profiled in 1953 when my grandmother was uh, chosen to be mother of the year. And it was because apparently according to the newspaper article because my family fit all of these, um, these traits. Um, it was not, it was, it was uh, not 100% true. There was still ongoing poverty, exclusion, discrimination, et cetera. Um, but it's the message that became so, um, so compelling. We see this in the civil rights movement with the model minority being explicitly used as a wedge issue to divide Asian Americans with black Americans. And and to delegitimize the civil rights um, movement's claims. Um, and here I'm gonna use a term that we are hearing a lot in the news, but claims that there is systemic racism in the United States and that despite the gains of the civil rights movement with the voting rights law, the civil rights law, that at its root, at its core, there were still um, 
um, policies and inequalities that were baked into the system that needed to be uprooted, that needed to be um, to completely dismantled. Asian Americans were held up to delegitimize that argument, to say that um, if systemic racism was really a thing, if it was really so hard to make it in the United States, then how do you explain the success of Asian Americans? How do you explain that they, while they had been discriminated against, and we're so sorry about that, but now they're so successful. It must be because systemic racism is not a thing. It must be because the Asian Americans are doing things the right way. And by, by inference, the message was, and that Black Americans and others are doing it the wrong way, that they're protesting in the streets when they should be um, heads down, you know, the nose to the grindstone, working hard, keeping quiet, um, respecting authority. This is, um, you know, an ongoing issue. Uh, we know that statistics uh, point out that the model minority framing is false. It's um, extremely simplistic. There's great diversity, great inequality within the Asian American community in terms of income inequality, some doing well, some generational poverty. Um, there's inequality in terms of educational attainment, uh, English language proficiency, et cetera. Um, but yet the model minority framing continues to be perhaps the most dominant way in which most Americans understand um, Asian Americans. And it continues to be a really dangerous wedge issue um, that divides our communities and also minimizes, ignores and minimizes the reality of ongoing discrimination, um, racial violence, racism um, that, do, that does impact Asian American communities. Thank you for that response. It's so true. This model minority myth um, continues to today and it's confusing for even like Asian Americans and non-Asian Americans. So thank you so much for clarifying that. Um, my next question is, um, let's see, how are we doing the time? How has the Asian American community responded to and what is the role of education, specifically the study of history in combating anti-Asian racism? So maybe Jason, you can yeah, sure. take a step. Um, I just have to say how awesome it is to have this conversation with you, Erica. I feel like, uh, um, you know, we are often running in parallel conversations. And so, you know, um, usually only get to see you at conferences or something like that. So this is just really great. Um, and, um, you know, I think it's, for me, it's also kind of cathartic to, you know, have these conversations because uh, the last year has been so challenging. And um, um, so even with all of the challenges though, I've been inspired by the ways that Asian Americans have stood up and have organized themselves anew um, and a, a whole new generation of youth has been politicized by these experiences and is not, you know, they see the model minority for what it is. There's a, there's a much more, there's a much stronger, or uh, how should I say, um, there's much more willingness to abandon that stereotype. Uh, whereas uh, maybe students in the past may have felt that there was some truth to it or that they could uh, kind of lean on that when um, uh, to gain a favorable expectation from someone. Um, but now, you know, uh, the, what I see from students is that they see the, the model minority as a liability for themselves, that there are mental health consequences uh, for doing that. And the, the risk of not saying anything is, um, you know, when, when you do get harassed or attacked means that, you know, someone else is gonna get attacked. 
and that that kind of knowledge and that kind of you know, uh, political education about the value of your voice is uh, just tremendous. And what I've seen it from, uh, from, you know, digital activism to, uh, to joining um, in the Black Lives Matter struggle, um, and really addressing, you know, uh, anti-blackness within the Asian American community. Those are all really, you know, important sort of mile markers for me over the last year to witness how Asian Americans have, um, have tried to examine themselves in this situation and, and raise their voice. Um, so I've, I've been a part of some of that and, um, and, one of, you know, as, as you're alluding to, uh, the importance of education is linking those personal experiences with a historical context. And so, you know, the realization that these things aren't new um, uh, kind of only gets you halfway because it, there's also a need to understand your own location where you are. And that's why we've been pushing for Asian American studies to be introduced in the K through eight curriculum in the state of Connecticut. Uh, so we have a bill that's been considered in the legislature, HB 6619, and um, the house just passed the budget, which has uh, funding for the State Department of Education to develop this curriculum along with Native American studies and LGBTQIA studies. Uh, so this is a phenomenal step forward. Um, we still need the final votes and the signature to make it law, but uh, this, is, this was an opportune moment to seize the attention that, we're ha that we have right now to make sure that future struggles are, are informed uh, by the work that we do now, right? So, uh, so that's why I, I have really try to emphasize that the changes that we wanna see are intergenerational, right? We have to lay the seeds for the changes that we wanna see in the future. We have to lay those seeds now. And, uh, and then we have to keep working. So the education reform is not a mandatory requirement for courses, for, for schools, that it, it will be up to departments, uh, boards of education, and individual districts to adopt the model curriculum. And that's going to require organized communities that can voice their demand for this and support teachers and families as they pick this up. So I see the education reform not just as, as say, a policy victory on its own, because it requires community action in order to implement it. And I see that as a continuation of the work that's happened over the last year of really consciousness raising, political education, and really developing curriculum so that, that students don't have to wait till they come to my class at UConn uh, to learn about Asian American studies. Heather, if I could just add a, a, a plug <laughs> um, and um, to elaborate uh, just a little bit on, on the amazing work that Jason is doing in Connecticut and that many others are doing um, across the country. But, but what Jason is doing is really leading um, and inspiring so many other efforts. Um, these educational reforms are not just um, uh, extra. It's not just to make certain communities feel good. It is an essential piece of an anti-racist education and in order to create an anti-racist society. Our colleague, Pavan Dingra, who um, teaches sociology at Amherst College and is the incoming president of the Asian Amer Association for Asian American Studies, wrote a, a great op-ed in March that talked about um, these educational efforts being a matter of life and death. When you have no education about 
Asian Americans, um, their long history in the United States, the fact that they have been victims of systemic racism, the activism that generations have engaged upon. When you have nothing, no content, no knowledge, what gets filled into that gap and that hole are the meanest and, and debased stereotypes. And that then allows for that spark to, to erupt into a fire, fire so that when you hear Wuhan virus, Kung flu, blame China, um, that's what gets activated. Um, so the, the importance of, of responding now uh, just could not be could not be greater. You know, we've we've had good news in terms of the Hate Crimes Act being passed um, in DC. But you know, to be honest, I think that the most important change has to happen in our local communities, uh, with our community organizations, and especially in our schools. Thank you for that, Erica. I was really going to give another plug for Jason too. He's been instrumental in pushing for this education in Connecticut. Um, so we really appreciate the effort um, you are pushing for. We so need it because I was having this moment um, during our teen Westport conversation. Some of the experiences I've had as a kid growing up in America, I just individualized that experience. And then 40 years later, just as this anti-hate um, was rising, my kids are telling me their experiences. And I had this aha moment or reckoning moment, like nothing's changed in 40 years. Same kind of anti-Asian hate things repeat. So we have to understand our history and make that connection so that we can learn from it, we can understand it better, we can process it better. Um, so thank you so much for this conversation. Um, uh, if, if I could, yeah. I, I just have to give a shout out to my team. Uh, this isn't just me alone doing this, uh, Kate Lee, um, uh, Jeff Gu and Mike Keogh have been wonderful partners in this, and we have uh, you know, succeeded beyond our wildest you know, uh, expectations. But I think it's because of experiences like that, that you're saying, where we're, we've met people in that process. And so um, it does really feel like, um, uh, like a collective moment and the timing was just right for it. So, um, you know, it, it really is a collective effort and I, I can't thank my team enough for, for sticking it out and, and, you know, running after, you know, uh, deadlines in the legislative process and being surprised by new hearings and, and all of that. So um, really, I, you know, such deep appreciation for, for them. Thank you. I think at this point, we're gonna open up um, for questions from the audience. So if you can line up and I've been instructed to keep, please keep your mask on and please don't touch the mic. Okay, okay. I've done my duty. <laughs> I don't think the mic is on. Oh, is the mic on? <laughs> Hello. Okay. So um, I actually have two questions and they go kind of um, far in range. One question is, you know, I constantly hear about um, Asian Americans arriving in this country in the 1800s. And I know you guys are historians and you can probably shed some more light on um, the education in this country. I feel like they focus a lot on the British American colonies. And you know, this country really was founded very recently, but the colonies were here before even the United States was here, right? And there was already a foundation um, of laws that were discriminatory then. Um, but there were also the Spanish American colonies, the French American colonies, and you know, they're all in the space of what is now United States. And no one talks about the Manila Galleon where during the 1560s all the way to 1850s, there was a global trade between Asia, America, and Europe. And um, during this time, Asians from all over 
Asia came to the United States. Well, what is now the United States? But nobody talks about that, and I don't understand why. They only talk about the Asians that came after the U.S. was established, and I don't, I don't know if that's like fair because, like, I don't know. Anyway, I, I just wanted to kind of ask why that is, um, why the Man Manila Galleon is overlooked, because it is a part of the Americas, and I just think it's important. And the other question spans completely in the opposite time frame of. You know, today, now there's like five states that have passed legislation against um, educating, well, schools from educating, um, you know, topics in school. Uh, they call it critical race theory, um, but it's basically like anything that suggests that um, the United States was founded on systemic racism. And it really challenges schools from having a diverse and like a diversity and inclusion program because how do you teach diversity and inclusion uh, with laws that ban this topic you know so with I think 11 states are now have legislation pending um, preventing this you know um, education from happening in schools public or private I think I'm not sure but I think it's really serious and I'm not sure why that's not talked about either. Great question. I'll turn it over to the historians. <laughs> I'll start I'll start with the, the first one. And you all are lucky because Jason and I are we represent a minority of Asian American historians who would completely agree with you that the origins of Asian American history do not uh, do not begin in the California gold rush, but in fact, much, much, much earlier. Um, and I'm so glad you brought up the Manila Galleons because when I was writing The Making of Asian America, I, I did, I thought, where, does, where do we begin? Where do we begin this history? Um, and our colleague Gary Okahiro had raised this question many, many years ago, you know, where, the where and when of Asian American history. And if we understand Asian American history as part of global history, of world history, then we absolutely have to begin not only with the Manila Galleon, but with Christopher Columbus, hate to say it, and, and the West's search for Asia. Um, and it's, it's through the connections and, and understanding that Asian peoples have been forced from their homes, um, have migrated abroad, that they've been part of these global movements that have not only brought people from faraway lands, but also um, have been part of, of the same settler colonial processes um, that have displaced indigenous peoples, that they have been part, there was a Pacific slave trade, they are part of the history of, of, of slavery um, in the Americas, then we really can um, date you know, the origins of Asian American history, not with the gold rush, but centuries, you know, centuries ago. Um, so this is, this is incredibly important. And I hope, I hope you'll get a chance to read about one of my favorite people from this era, which is Mira Katerina de San Juan, who represents um, this, this global history. And then the other question, which I know Jason will have much more to, to, um, to talk about, but this is a reflection of our fractured um, society and the politicization of, of race. This is, goes hand in hand with the efforts um, to suppress the vote. I mean, these are serious, serious issues and that again are not just um, cosmetic. It's not just a grievance towards one community, but they really represent uh, fundamental debates about what is America? What is American history? Um, what counts, you know, and, and what should be taught? And I, I, I'm just, um, I'm, I'm very concerned, you know, very concerned about these efforts and, um, and wonder, wonder what that means for all of us who are teaching and learning, um, uh, teachers and learners of, of U.S. history. Yeah, uh, same. I, I, I mean, I feel the um, very similarly on both questions with you, Erica. Um, yeah, for me, you know, the I'll, I'll take them 
I won't take much time, so because I know there's some other questions. But there's such a foundational question, both of them, for me, uh, because you know, when in thinking about the Manila galleons as um, as a, one of the threads or one of the origin stories for Asian diasporas in the Americas, it kind of decenters the United States as the core, you know, story making kind of um, uh, body in which to understand the Asian American experience. So, um, you know, for me, it rewrites, you know, including the galleons, rewrites the entire kind of periodization in which we look at Asian diasporas and the United States fits into that, uh, into that larger narrative. Um, and, you know, one of the things that we learn from that is that there are, you know, repeated patterns in which, you know, the, um, before the United States excludes Chinese, the Spanish Empire excluded the Chinese because of fears of competition, right? There were massacres of Chinese in the Philippines because of a fear of invasion, right? So, um, so in some ways, the idea of yellow peril, this idea that there are, you know, this potential foreign invasion, dangerous foreigners, um, is a kind of settler colonial fantasy. You know, that is a way of rationalizing war, rationalizing the exclusion of other people that has been practiced not only by the United States, but other empires. Um, and, you know, for me, the galleon trade in the Spanish, including the Spanish empire is a really important precursor to understanding the coolie trade, which happened in the early 1800s. Right, and that was a uh, trade in indentured Asians, include Chinese and South Asians primarily, um, and they were, you know, uh, transported all over the world, but primarily to fill the um, the labor demands after the uh, de-escalation and dismantling of the African slave trade in the Atlantic. Right, so you have coolies then fitting into that plantation system. So if we shift the origins to the galleon trade and coolies, right, then we don't start with immigrants denied citizenship, right? We start with, uh, with empire, we start with slavery, right? And we start with, and, and struggles for liberation, right? And I think that generates a much more rich kind of field for thinking about possible futures. That brings me to the critical race theory criticism. Because if you limit what people know, it's gonna limit what they can imagine, right? And so part of the, the, the consequence of the anti-critical race theory work is to not just, not just create poverty of knowledge now, but to create poverty of imagination. And that I think is a really you know, crucial, um, uh, thing to fight for uh, and to struggle for because the, um, the imagination or the, the material that's available to us now, it gives us, you know, sort of limited options, right? And so the more that we can expose the, uh, the rich historical, you know, relationships that, uh, that we've developed here, uh, the more we can we can push that that future boundary, um, and so I think it's not just a kind of um, a kind of critique, uh, like a, a kind of culture war critique, because the right doesn't ever really define what critical race theory is. It's just anti diversity, right? And, and so when, when you look at what is included in ethnic studies, in critical race theory, it generates the content, the kinds of things that will, that will facilitate greater knowledge and, and capacity to imagine other, other futures. Right. Next question. Um, how do I respond to assumptions and comments made about being um, Asian? Like, for example, asking where I'm really from. <laughs> this is the, the age old question. Um, 
and of course it signifies right that you we don't are cannot be from westport cannot be from minneapolis we must be from somewhere else somewhere asian um you know, I'll be I'll be interested to hear what what Jason and, and Heather say about this. I still don't know how to answer that. And frankly, it really does depend on the situation. And I do think that that's important. It depends on the situation. Um, it, you want to first make sure that you um, that you feel safe because it is an antagonistic question. It is an exclusionary question, aggressive question. Um, it's not just one that's about curiosity and showing interest in you. You know, so quite frankly, it depends for me about um, how I'm feeling. Do I, am I feeling a little testy and impatient and just kind of fed up? And if, <laughs> if I am, I, I might ask, why do you ask? You know, what, what's behind that assumption? Uh, why, do you, why do you think that I'm, I'm not from here? Um, I might counter with, where are you from? <laughs> um, I might play the game and say, I'm from, I'm from Minneapolis. And then of course they'll say, well, well, well where, where are you, where are you really from? <laughs> oh, well, I was born in New York and I can go back several generations. I can do this all day, you know? Um, <laughs> so I think it really depends, depends on where you are, who, who is the person asking, um, it really is important that, you know, another thing about those, those hate crime statistics is that the vast majority are directed at women. The vast majority are directed at either the elderly or the youth. And so our personal safety is important. Um, but there are many ways, many ways to counter that question more aggressively or not. Um, and, and, hopefully, you know, thinking about it a little bit ahead of time might be helpful just because I have found in the heat of the moment, I'm, I'm always just a little, oh, this is happening again and, and, and left unprepared a bit. Um, so I don't know. I, I don't know what Jason and Heather have, have to offer as a response, but I'd be interested in hearing it. Yeah, I mean, I also feel that it's contextual and um, I get different kinds of questions depending on different parts of the country that I'm in. You know, like sometimes like I can, for some reason I also pass as like Latino. And, uh, and so, um, you know, but sometimes, you know, it's a question that leads to connection. Like somebody is sort of genuine, genuinely interested in that it, connects maybe to their, um, their experiences of being othered in the same space. And they're like, well, are you, do you live here? Can I connect with you? Are you from here? You know, like, so that sometimes there's that. And I try to, I've gotten better at feeling out people's energy, but, um, but it is something to, um, uh, to kind of think about because it's those, it's those moments when you have to think how much energy do you want to invest in that relationship? Um, if this is like a passing, you know, kind of thing at the post office, um, you know, I, save yourself, you know? <laughs> um, if this is a potential friend that you meet at the library, perhaps at Westport, um, then maybe there's a chance to create a, a connection there. Um, but um, my friend um, and colleague at UConn, Fred Lee, he wrote this amazing tweet where he said, um, you know, the critiques that Asians don't belong here, um, uh, the response should be, well, you don't belong here either, right? Which is a, a, a critique that illustrates that we are on indigenous land, right? That we are also, you know, that many people <laughs> should be considered visitors. Uh, and, and that that could be a, a way to, if you are in passing at the grocery store, maybe that's the kind of, uh, but again, I really want to underscore what Erica said about safety, um, that you really want to consider your surroundings and 
um, because you frankly just don't know uh, what's going to happen. And, and so that, you know, that can be uh, frightening. Uh, but at the same time, I think when we come to grips with that, we understand how important these conversations are. Um, I'm really sad to hear that we have to be concerned about our safety and responding. Well, first of all, why are we even asked the question in the first place? I think it just highlights the need to have more conversations, education about Asian Americans or Asians in America. Um, particularly, I mean, because Erica, you wrote the book, and so many of us, and you're a historian of American history as well, and you're multi generational um, Asian American. I can't believe that you get you know, bombarded with those questions too. I mean, my go to response is what do you mean? Where are you from? <laughs> So I would leave it at that, but I think it definitely accentuates the need to have more conversations like this and education. Um, next question. Uh, hi, I have like a question I've been thinking about for a while, I guess, just coming from like personal experiences, like how can we like encourage a conversation about like Asian racism or racism within like the school system? Cause like, I remember, especially at like a young age for me, like I felt like in elementary school, I definitely felt the heat of Asian racism the most with just jokes that I guess kids don't understand what they're saying. So yeah. Yeah, that's a tough one. Um, there are so many different ways and I, I think this is a multi-pronged approach. Um, first, you know, I encourage teachers and I encourage parents to be drawing upon the phenomenal wealth of children's books, <laughs> from board books to picture books to YA on the Asian American experience, that these things just did not exist when I was growing up. They have grown in, in number um, since, since my kids were little. But I, I, and we read as a family books about race and the Asian American experience from a very, very young age. And the reason why was obviously just not only because this is part of what I do, but also because it's part of preparing children to be resilient. It's part of, of, of allowing children to see themselves represented in all a variety of different types of life, right? Not just the one stereotype that might exist. Um, uh, in, in popular culture. So that even if they are, uh, they experience that kind of, of bullying, um, they are resilient. That, that hopefully it's, it's not something that gets internalized to the degree that, that it has been in previous generations, that there's, um, that there's a response, right? The other thing is, I, I think it's time for, for families to have that race talk with their kids, similar to the ways in which African-American families have to have the race talk with their, especially with their young men. Um, we have to have the race talk with our, with our kids as well so that they're prepared. But then of course in the schools, the same thing, but represented, representation in literature, in, in the arts, in, um, in our social studies and calling out, calling out racism um, when it happens. Um, my son, who's now a college freshman, says he doesn't remember this, but I definitely remember um, calling the teacher um, in kindergarten because he staged a little little sort of walkout in music class when during piano lesson time, they were called upon to play that song from the Disney movie Lady and the Tramp about the Siamese cats nod your head if you know what I'm talking about. It's a horribly racist, um, horribly racist um, cartoon characters. They're, they've got slanted eyes, they're sneaky, they're treacherous. And then it's got that Ching Chong Chinaman, um, you know, um, musical thread. We had watched this film as a family, um, not my choice. Um, and I had said, you know, that family is making fun of, of Asian people. It's not, that's not my favorite. It's also making fun of Irish and Italian people too, by the way. And we kind of had just like a little talk about that. And then the music teacher 
had them play the song and he, he sat on his hands <laughs> and he said this this film this song is making fun of Chinese people and so then I called the teacher to explain explain the the little walk out there um so I think we need to, to we need to respond to things big and small to raise awareness um let alone, of course, advocate for these larger legislative uh, uh, programs and bills um, to include uh, Asian American history and studies at, at, the, at the older level. So it has to happen in our families, in our schools, and over big and small issues. Yeah. I completely agree, you know. Um, I've been working with some high school groups in Connecticut. Um, and one of the things that has come out is, you know, the, the need to, to ask adults, trusted adults to carve out space, to make space for these conversations. Um, they're not used to doing that, but it's student voices that are leading uh, these spaces within schools. And it's very exciting because they're also teaching their teachers. And, um, and you know, what, you, what I think people are finding is that there, you know, as Erica, you so expertly pointed out, Asian Americans don't frequently, you know, have a kind of uh, a way of thinking of their experience as racialized. And, and it's when you hear it reflected in someone else's story that you realize that it's not just you. And that's an important realization. And that can galvanize a group to, to make concerted effort, uh, concerted changes. And so I really believe in the power of dialogue to you know, listen to each other, hear their stories, reflect together, and then act. I think those are really important dimensions of carving out space. What do you expect from space you know, to, to have those kinds of exchanges is collective action. And I think you know, um, being able to do that, regardless if you have Asian American studies in your school or not, um, you have a right to share your stories and listen to each other. Thank you. I think we have um, another question. Hi. Um, I was wondering if maybe you could talk a little bit about how Asian Americans and Black Americans are being pitted against one another in like social media and like the news. Were you able to hear the question? Yeah, I think it was about Asian Americans and African Americans. Yeah. Um, can you still hear me? Yeah, OK. Um, I'll just make a, a quick comment, and you can you can you know reply to Erica. Um, I think any time that we see intergroup conflict raised to the level of kind of like media attention, uh, that's always a signal that white supremacy is trying to re you know find some new common ground or some you know readjust the terms of uh, of engagement and that's how we can also track how uh you know like the model minority idea uh formed right and so um in this moment where where there's we actually have a lot of political and media attention to anti-asian racism particularly attacks there's also this assumption that those attacks are coming from african americans right uh which comes from an over reporting of African American crime, or you know the, that that there is black crime, right? And so you know this is an, an important distinction to make and to not fall into those uh, those kinds of, of you know ready made stories. Um, and I think you know when we look at um, at how that idea of anti Asian violence is used as a way to maybe, you know, suggest Asian Americans, suggest to Asian Americans that they should side with, um, with policing, with whiteness, 
right? That that is a crucial, uh, you know, kind of political decision in this moment in which uh, Black Lives Matter has, you know, has organized for the last the last year, uh, for much longer, but for for this period in which we're also looking at anti the rise of anti Asian racism. That again, there is this this use of Asian Americans to to kind of temper and uh, and subdue um, black radical thought. And I think that this is a moment to um, to really you know uh, reflect on that. I don't have much to add, but just to um, point to a couple different resources. One is a new project called. Um, virulent hate project, which has been tracking and analyzing data, and one of their recent reports, um, you know, tabulates and and refutes the um, the uh, popular idea that most of these hate incidents is being um, perpetrated by by black assailants, when in fact ninety percent are by white. And then the other is um, the various different uh, projects from the Asians for Black Lives, um, um, sort of a grassroots efforts, but these wonderful letters um, that are meant to help introduce conversation with um, mothers and fathers and aunties and uncles and grandparents um, about why uh, Black Lives Matter to, uh, to Asian Americans. They're available in many, many different um, languages, but also they're just instructive to um, to help better understand the issues, um, the context, and the and the divisive rhetoric. I think we have one more uh, question from the audience, and then I think we're going to have to wrap up. All right, hi there. I actually had the same uh, same question, um, but I was also going to add that. Um, and one important point is that perpetrators who are people of color perpetrating anti-Asian violence um, were raised, or could they have been raised in this society of white supremacy? So, and um, of the, or under the model minority myth. So I just wanted to add that. But um, my question, new question is about if you could speak to the history of cross-cultural racial solidarity and what kind of lessons we can use from the history of that solidarity and the collective activism that can be applied today. Thank you. That's a great question. And, and let me add another term and that is indebtedness. Um, Asian Americans indebtedness to black activism, um, meaning that the civil rights struggles that black and other activists have waged um, on behalf of, of their own civil rights journeys have benefited, have benefited Asian Americans. Um, so for example, one of the uh, very well-known civil rights cases is the Supreme Court case of Wong Kim Ark versus the United States in 1898. This is a birthright citizenship case, meaning Wong Kim Ark was born in the United States, was a US citizen, but after a trip to visit his parents in China, immigration officials tried to deny him entry um, by questioning whether it was really constitutional to allow persons of Chinese descent to, um, to have birthright citizenship. He waged a battle that went all the way to the Supreme Court. Um, he waged a battle that grew upon and expanded earlier civil rights battles by black activists that had established birthright citizenship as a guarantee um, under the 14th Amendment. Uh, there are many, many other examples of that indebtedness, actually including most recently, um, the fact that the, the murderer of um, the perpetrator of the mass killings in Atlanta will be tried under Georgia's new hate crime, uh, hate crime law, a law that was um, passed 
uh, just in June of 2020 in response to George Floyd, in response to Ahmed Aubrey. This is a, a, a law that, that is now being applied um, to identify what happened in Atlanta as a hate crime directed towards um, Asian Americans. So those are, that's one aspect of the indebtedness. And then there are several examples of, of solidarity, including um, Filipino Americans and Mexican Americans joining together um, to, uh, to uh, strike um, in Delano, California, strike for better wages as farm workers to help establish the United Farm Workers um, uh, Union. There's the well-known uh, friendship of, of Japanese American activist Yuri Kochiyama and Malcolm X. There's Grace Lee Boggs and James Boggs working together in Detroit. Um, and I would also include uh, Asians for Black Lives, um, so many, so many different, uh, so many different movements that during the Trump era, you know, have been multiracial, multi-ethnic, um, interfaith. Uh, so that when when I'd go out in the streets uh, in Minneapolis for the no Muslim ban protests, um, I'd see a range of of people. And then when I'd go back out for the no kids in cages protests. The Muslim ban people were there as were so many other communities. Um, this, is, this is, I think, a, a really fruitful time for these solidarities to, um, to grow and flourish, not just because they've been happening a long time ago in the past, but because they have been happening and have been strengthened um, in very recent years. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Sharon Charm. I'm one of the uh, members of the API Westport. Um, it's an incredible educational and insightful conversation. I feel like I can go on for hours here. Um, but I want to say thank you to Erica and Jason for sharing your time today. Thank you to Heather for moderating our conversation. Um, and also what finally just want to thank the library for giving us the space. Um, I hope that tonight's conversation helped you understand what it means to be Asian Americans and that you learned what you learned today was spark meaningful conversations in your schools, at home, and in the workplace. Um, we love to be connecting with you. So if you'd like to get in touch with us, you can actually find us on email at aapiwestport at gmail.com, or you can follow us on Instagram at aapiwestport. And finally, for the folks that are here in person, um, Erica's book is over there on the right-hand side. You'd like to pick up a copy before you leave. Thank you guys for coming and have a good night. <laughs>